Hello, Malcolm. Well, I'd just like to first and foremost uh, officially welcome you to the Glasgow clan and to take on the role. How is it feeling? Is it is it sunk in yet? Then what's uh, what's your current status on becoming the head coach of the Glasgow clan? How are you feeling? Well, it's uh, been it's awesome. I've been excited since uh, we had the call last week, late last week, and uh, accepted the position. And then it's been 100 mile an hour ever since. So, uh, you know, calling agents, doing research on players, reaching out to coaches here in North America, uh, ex-players that I've had before. Uh, like all over the place right now, just trying to gather as much information on who's out there and available to, to play for our club. So uh, I haven't really stopped, to be honest with you. But I, 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 you know, I love this. This is one of the things I loved uh, about being in North America when I coached here all these years and, and I ran my own team uh, uh, and had to recruit the players is the, the war, the recruiting war, as we called it. Uh, to be able to get out and, and beat the bushes to find the best guys available. So uh, I'm going full bore. I know uh, a little bit behind some of the other clubs, uh, uh, but that doesn't mean anything at the end of the day. Uh, there's lots of good players out there, and we're working hard to convince them that uh, our club's the place to be. Do you know, I think that's something that the club fans will be really delighted to hear you say straight off the bat because obviously fans will be watching progress around the league and with uh, with all the uncertainty that's happened around the clan and the takeover, obviously now it's a, a period of great excitement that we're embarking on, but obviously that's a, a major factor. Fans want to know that the work's going on behind the scenes and the background. So that's not something that is... Uh, is what did you at all then just the, the the late start or the perceived late start shall i say well i mean you know there there's always guys that that sign early i mean the, they do they like to get it done and and rest easy I, I guess over the course of the summer but there's guys there's lots of guys that hold out you know and they want to see what their different options are they're undecisive and then all of a sudden we come into the mix and and try and uh convince them that we're the place to be but you know there is still here with players in north america for example uh, a lot of uncertainty to whether they're going to go back to their echl clubs are they going to try and maybe get an american league opportunity there's guys that were on expired american league deals that won't get another one that all of a sudden they're going to scramble do i want to you know bust around the echl or should I try Europe? So uh, there's such a different dynamic, especially coming off a of COVID year uh, where there was a lot of guys that didn't even play. So there's there's a different player pool every year. The COVID uh, pandemic obviously changed that player pool dramatically. Uh, I mean, guys that had jobs in Europe for years now maybe struggling to find a job. Uh, you know, obviously the economics of hockey have changed because of the pandemic. That all factors into it. So, you know, a lot of things that our, our fans maybe didn't know about uh, all factor into it, you know. But uh, uh, rest assured, uh, my my phone has been going absolutely crazy. My WhatsApp, my text, my email, it's been crazy here over the last uh, four days. Do you know, I, I, I can just imagine, John, I'm sure the client fans want to know is, as soon as possible we'll get into the style of play and the style of hockey that your team's playing that you would like the glasgow clan to be but first we need to talk about the experience that you bring to this role and you know the, you've got some incredible amount of experience in the east coast league and and then some of the stats that come with it you know being the fifth uh, all-time winner of games as a head coach in the in the east coast a phenomenal achievement but the one that i'd really like to kind of pick up as well is having two of the uh, biggest point increases in ECHL history. Now, that's quite an achievement in the first place to be in the top five of that anyway. But to do it twice, could you tell us a little bit about your experience in the coast and, and how you managed to achieve that? Well, to be honest with you, I was kind of always brought in to clean up bad teams. <laughs> and, and I worked for the same ownership group. I had to work back to back to back for the same ownership group that owned three of those teams. So uh, when I first went into Cincinnati, it was a team that was struggling. Uh, we ended up going to the game seven of the semifinals in the league that year, um, coming off a non-playoff year. And then they sold the team and I moved out to Long Beach and we had one of those big turnarounds 44 points i think it was uh went from, you know 49 points or something to 95 uh, and then they sold that team and i went to texas where they owned their third team and uh and this was 
I think we had a 46 point improvement there. And then the next year we had uh, the least amount of losses in ECHL history with only nine and 72 games. And I don't think that record will be beaten. So, um, you know, the real good, uh, you know, stretch and a lot of the, the ECHL, very similar to the UK is recruiting uh, as well as your NHL, AHL affiliations helping you out. But, uh, you know, not the, the the best markets that I was in uh, hockey wise, you know, Long Beach, California, dead smack between L.A. and Anaheim minor. Yeah. Take market lots of financially, you know, hardship for, for the owners to sustain that team. And then Texas should have been a slam dunk. You know, it was a smaller city, but, um, you know, not a traditional sports market at all. Team moved to California and I decided I, I'd already been to California. I wanted to go to Florida instead. So I went east instead of west. <laughs> and, uh, but, I, I, you know, my experience is, is, is really varied. I played uh, university hockey in Canada at Acadia University. I won a national championship as a player. Uh, played five years in the minors here in North America, and then I retired and went right into coaching at Acadia. And uh, that's kind of where I started to build my resume, went from there to pro for an assistant for two years, uh, went to league finals my first year as a pro coach. Uh, the next year I went to Columbia, South Carolina, and we had the best expansion record in the ECHL history. Uh, left uh, the ECHL and I went to major junior hockey in Canada, which for the, the fans of the clan may not know, the WHL uh, puts over 20% of the NHL players uh, in, in the league. So, you know, there's a number of guys uh, for NHL followers uh, that I coached against Leon Dreisaitl in Edmonton, Josh Morrissey. Uh, saw a whole lot of them in my division yeah. all the time. Uh, Ryan Pulak of the New York Islanders. Uh, another one, um, you know, just uh, Morgan Riley, Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, we had a number of NHL players on our roster that ended up going uh, to play in the National League. So it was a good, it was a different challenge because the age is much younger, 16 to 20. Uh, yeah. But you're, you're, you're battling your wits against NHL coaches every night, guys that have, you know, coached in the National League. So as a, as a challenge for a coach, I, I, to be honest with you, coaching against the Western League coaches was a, was a really good challenge and I really enjoyed it. Uh, ended up going to teach at a prep school for a couple of years uh, where I had several high draft picks, uh, including Michael Rasmussen, who now plays for the Detroit Red Wings. He was a first round pick. And then I went back to the ECHL and then over to Europe. So, uh, you know, it's been a, a great journey. I'm, I'm very lucky that uh, in my whole adult life since I graduated college, all I've ever done has been blessed to be employed in the game. And I don't take I don't take it for granted. Believe me, it's a uh, it's, it's a privilege to be a player in this game. It's a privilege to be a coach and a manager in this game. And uh, this is all I've ever done for for 29. This will be the 30th year. Uh, you know, I've been involved in pro hockey. Well, you know, and it's, it's interesting there, obviously, the East Coast hockey, a lot of the fans in the UK are aware of the North American hockey, the leagues there. We know how difficult the East Coast League is, just in terms of, one, the talent that's there, but also the size of it and the size of the country that you're traveling. There's so many kind of difficulties there. But you did see, you, it's not the first time in Europe. You've you've been over, of course, a little bit of experience over in Europe. Um, how, did, how did you find that compared to the experience you've had there? You've talked about training with the young guys, training with the older guys, spotting different talent and working with bigger budget, lower budget organizations. How different a challenge was it coming to Europe? Uh, when, when I, you know, I started the year, I decided I was going to coach late in the summer. So most of the jobs, to be honest with you, were uh, were gone. So uh, yeah. uh, the agent I was working with at the time found me a, a job in the Italian second league. Uh, but we knew that, you know, inevitably somebody's going to lose their job and I'd have an opportunity to move up uh, with with the Italian league. The hockey was really good. It was very surprisingly good. But all the players worked. You know, they had day yeah. jobs. So we, we practiced. I was going to say, that's, surely that was a challenge you've never come up against before, was no. actually having to accommodate such an amount of your team not having hockey as their focus. That must have been a brand new challenge for you. 
Well, it, 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 I'll tell you, their focus was hockey, not the regular jobs, to be honest with you. <laughs> but the practice at night, you know, uh, 7, 8 o'clock yeah. at night, uh, certainly a challenge. Uh, our home arena was open on two sides. So uh, I, I'd never been in a, really an outdoor building or a venue before. Uh, that was interesting, uh, especially <laughs> during training camp when the sun was beating down and it was 90 degrees at ice level. <laughs> That, that was a, a challenge. And then when I had the opportunity to go to uh, to Romania and the Earth League, I mean, the hockey was unbelievable. We had uh, several guys with over 600 games, KHL experience, uh, you know, guys that had played all over the world, in the, the SHL, the, the SM League in Finland, uh, Ice League. Uh, so the caliber was good. Um, the, the language was uh, – most of the guys were all able to function in English. Uh, how I, I couldn't pronounce any of their names, the, the local players. So what I did was I gave them all English nicknames, every single oh, one of them. I'm sure they love that. They, they actually, they, they, did, they, they called them, they, you know, a Hungarian, the Romanian, the Romanian citizens, but Hungarian blood. Uh, yeah. They all spoke Hungarian, but, it would, you know, you'd have a guy, uh, for an example, we had one guy, his name was Hunor Chaba Elikish Darabont. Doesn't roll off the tongue on the bench, does it? Uh, that's a no. tricky one on the bench when you're trying to be quick. <laughs> yeah, so he, he was Urkel. We nicknamed him Urkel after Steve Urkel and the TV show. <laughs> right. uh, and, 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 you know, other guys were like, you know, big long names, but we called him George and Fred. <laughs> the, the fun thing about it was they come in in the morning for practice. They're all calling each other by their nicknames. <laughs> hey, George. Hey, Fred. Hey, Big Joe. Like, they really yeah. embraced it so they were relatively new to professional hockey and uh, Jericho semi cloche which is another mouthful of a name. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you said it. I was, I was the U.S. first. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were, when I got there, it was their second year of real professional hockey. Previously, they'd been in the Romanian yeah. league. So they were just understanding professionalism, but the players really craved it. And, uh, you know, for most of them, they hadn't played with North American players before, uh, so that was a bit of a new experience or certainly a North American coach. Uh, but, you know, we, we gelled and uh, the guys really embraced learning a structured environment, both, you know, coming to the rink and a routine and and a professional atmosphere and a role on a club. And uh, we went from ninth place uh, to third and won a bronze medal. So uh, that, that might have been the most proud coaching job I've ever been a part of or a team because, in complete transparency, uh, we were not a very talented team. Uh, and to be able to, you know, get a bronze medal with a chance at a gold had the season not have been closed uh, was very rewarding. I really enjoyed that. Well, I guess that, that challenge sets up quite nicely for the next challenge, which is obviously the Glasgow clan. And could you could you give me an insight into what, your, uh, what you knew about the Elite League and what you knew about the clan uh, before applying for the job and, and what led you to apply to it? Well, the you know, several things. I've, I've had many players that have played over in the UK, uh, guys that have gone over and come back, guys that went over and didn't come back. But uh, it was always a very positive experience, uh, you know, for them. I never heard anybody say anything negative about the league or anything like that. I know a few guys that have played for the clan, uh, Matthew Waugh, who played for me here in Florida. Uh, with the Everblades, uh, goaltender Joel Rumpel. I think you guys had a couple of years back. Uh, Joel yeah. played part of the season for me as well. And, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, video of the games and the fans and and uh, the pregame show and everything like that. So it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun and a very entertaining building. Uh, I know it's very similar. It's probably the closest league to North American style hockey as you're going to find over there. Um you know, for me, I love new challenges. Um, you know, to go to a North American style league is probably a little bit tailor made for me because this, these are the types of teams I normally build. Um, the fact that it's in Scotland, uh, you know, and we can certainly touch more on that in a few minutes. Uh, we're very, uh, you know, very appealing for me. You know, the the, the Scottish part. Um, uh, the fact that I think uh, all the fans know what you're talking about there. We're literally got our little name tags up here, and your name's more Scottish than mine. So <laughs> we, will, we, will talk, we will get. I will get round to that in a moment. Yeah. So I knew that was something you were aware of. Yeah. Very, very, uh, you know, appealing. Obviously, 
you know, with the heritage part of it for me, um, you know, and it's always been a dream of mine to go to Scotland. I've always wanted to go. It's a part of the world, uh, probably the most preeminent part of the world that I haven't been to that it's certainly at the top of my bucket list. Uh, but the fact that I like the challenge of, uh, you know, rebuilding a new hockey club, you know, one that obviously didn't play last year, um, you know, uh, the team hasn't won a championship yet. So, you know, to have a chance to build something kind of from the ground up again uh, is very exciting. And, um, you know, for me, I, I love to, to have new experiences you know, and uh, meet new people and, and make friends in different places. You know, I, I've got good friends in Italy now. I've got good friends in Romania, people I talk to in Hungary and Germany and Austria. So it's part of part of being around as long as I have uh, is is you know learning to appreciate these new experiences. Oh, well, I'm sure you'll make plenty of new friends here anyway. I can see it is such a uh, hockey, such a small yet international community. It, it is certainly amazing. I, I guess one of the things you were touching on there as well is that the clan has gone through this transformation. You know, a lot of uh, people have been even worried about the, the continued existence of the club and the format it was in. The building, of course, was the big question. Obviously, with the good news that things are moving ahead and the fact that there is this potential like never before for the club. And your role as part of that is very different to anything else we've had from a, a head coach at the club before. It is that head coach, director of hockey operations combined role. And there will be more um, control for you and, and, and pressure, I guess, that comes with that than has ever been on a, a clan head coach before. How does that challenge uh, take your fancy and what's your, what are your thoughts on taking that role and, and how different it is for the club going forward? Well, it's probably only different for you because I did that role here in North America <laughs> for 14 years. So, yeah, and part, of, part of being a head coach here in the ECHL is you are the director of hockey operations. I've been vice president of hockey operations and alternate governor even where I sat in with the owners and, and voted. So, uh, you know, I've done just about everything, Jerry, from immigration to player housing to working. You know, I, I always was the guy who went out and got the NHL affiliations and uh, to build a legal document to affiliate with an NHL club, uh, travel, you know, when, when you make trades in our league to, you know, doing the, all the paperwork at the players union and the league. Uh, I mean, there hasn't a hat, there isn't a hat that I haven't worn. Uh, and when you do that, you learn to manage your time very wisely. So, you know, over the years, I think my time management skills really were built in the ECHL uh, with a number of things that you have to do. And coaching is, is, you know, a fraction of the job. It's not 100% because you, we deal with a salary cap here, you know, as part of our league rules, there's a salary cap. It's a daily cap that you have to follow and you have to have matching paperwork. Uh, when you have, you lose players to the American hockey league and you have to bring in new players, uh, you got to find housing for them and maneuver all of your team apartments around, pick up to the airport, get them guys going to the airport that are going up. Uh, you know, the, the, even from equipment ordering, all of those things, hotels, meals, per diem on the road. So, uh, I mean, certainly when Gareth brought it up, it wasn't anything. I kind of laughed. Uh, I said, are you kidding me? This sounds like an easy job compared to some of the ones that I've had before. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you do finally get your, your clan hat on, and this, this is obviously the main question that clan fans want to know, is what style of hockey team is going to be as a clan, a Glasgow clan, Malcolm Cameron team going to be? What is the style that you think I, you identify with and, and should work for this team here? Well, I, I, I'd say two, two things. I want a team that's tough to play against every night where, you know, there's a lot of things you can't control in hockey. You can't control the ice. You can't control the boards. You can't control the referees. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, other, the other team's trying to win as well. You know, you've got injuries. you got illness. you got all sorts of different other variables that go along. But regardless of what your lineup looks like every night, the team, when they leave playing the clan, knows they were in a fight. And, mm. and they, you know, the clan will be a tough team to beat. And, you know, in the trenches and going hard to the net, protecting the front of the net, uh, you know, a tough team to play against means when we own the puck, you have to kill us to take it off us, that, that type of style of play. So, uh, you know, I'm a, I like I like to own the puck. I like to play tough. I like to 
to get pucks to the net. Uh, you know, the first year here rebuilding this team, we might not be a team uh, that can match up in what we call a track meet going up and down the ice, trying to trade chances uh, with the other team because we might not necessarily have the, the same firepower that they'd have. But it doesn't mean you can't win. And and we t- this was our style in, in Jericho when I was there in Romania. We had by far the lowest scoring team in the playoffs. We played a playoff style hockey right from the day that I got there, October 16th. So when we got to the playoffs, we didn't have to change. Other teams had to try and change to beat us. And it was very successful. Nobody wants to play against a miserable team. <laughs> well, there you are. I mean, in Glasgow, we've got the miserable weather, but we've got, but everyone else is, isn't miserable. So we want to, oh. the style of hockey you're describing sounds like it would uh, appeal to the fan base here, certainly. Well, I'm glad because it's a, uh, it's a fun style to play. I mean, obviously we're, you know, we're going to try and have a, you know, good special teams and, and some, you know, some good skilled players that can score some beautiful goals. The fans can get excited about, but in terms of the overall character and identity of your team, the identity of what, when people think of the clan is just a miserable team to play against. And, and one that, <laughs> one that just, you know, the next game is a photocopy of the last game. And you see that every night. Yeah, that's. I mean, that sounds like the kind of thing that people like to see here. I think they like to see a hardworking team, and you know, the fans give so much of their energy. And is that something that you'd been told about? You said you, you know, obviously done your research asking about yeah. people. But this certainly a point of pride in Glasgow is the the atmosphere that gets created, and especially when the team show the the heart, which the, which they have done in the past as well. Here, they they get it back tenfold from the fans. Is that something that you'd heard at all? Did you have been given any information like that? Yeah, no, for sure. That was the one thing that I heard is the the fan base certainly appreciates, you know, uh, you know, hard work and uh, tough team, and and everybody always says, oh, we want to be hardworking. I mean, that's almost like a cliche now. So I don't ever use that hard work. I say tough to play against because that that really gives you a good visual in your brain when you think of that. Okay, that puck's ours. Come and t- I dare you to come and take it. You want the puck? Good luck. <laughs> because we're coming to take it from you. And that's the style, very in your face, pressure all the time. I don't believe in and and playing passive. I never have. There's there, you know, obviously you've got a number of injuries in your lineup and you're playing with 12 or 13 skaters. You've got to change a little bit in some areas of your game. Very similar to here in the ECHL. Uh, but at the end of the day, your core values as a club is in your face, tough, 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 scrappy, sandpaper, whatever, you know, kind of cliche you want to use. And, and our skilled players will play that way too. Out of interest, see, as we talk about the club developing over these next few years, and as you mentioned, they're coming off the back of a COVID year and all, all the teams in the elite league, there's been a, you know, will be adjusting their budgets accordingly to that and looking to get back on their feet and move forward. Maybe the clan slightly more so than others. It's always difficult to know. But do you see, as the years progress, a different style evolving from the team? Or do you see the style of hockey always being the same and just and just growing in a different way? Do we need to go through various stages to get from where we are to getting the trophies in the cabinet? I, I don't think your core values as a club ever change. Now, you know, it's no different than the National Hockey League. You look at uh, you look at teams that do well with their drafting, and they maybe they draft more skill, uh, better skaters, uh, you know, guys that just have a better hockey IQ. But your core values as a, as a club and how you play and, and the dirty things that you need to do to win championships that never changes. And yeah, it certainly will. Will the clan evolve over several years with a maybe a better skill based team? Certainly, that's the hope. Uh, you know, guys that maybe are a little bit faster than some of the guys that we have, but you still want those guys playing the same identity that you're going to play in year one. And and I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, that your program is self-sustaining. And when guys, because of your culture, when the new guys walk into the locker room, they're instantly immersed in that team culture where everything is earned, nothing is given. We play hard to the final horn. Uh, we're we're going to go to battle with you in all the dirty areas. And we're going to make it as tough as we possibly can for you to put that in the cage. 
Well, I think people will be really looking forward to seeing that style of hockey in, in Glasgow. We we'll certainly look forward to having you over in uh, in Scotland as well and getting in touch with some of your your roots. Then uh, I, we can go into this a little bit later. I'd like to do another interview, as, as you know, but we should definitely touch on it just now. I mean, it's it's not escaped uh, anyone's noticed that you've got a very Scottish name there. Uh, am I right in saying that your middle name's even Angus? That's right, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, my dad, my dad, <laughs> my dad's name's Angus. His father's name was John Angus. So yeah, it's uh, uh, my brother's Duncan, <laughs> Duncan wow. Alexander Cameron. So uh, very Scottish from uh, Nova Scotia, which everybody who probably knows is Gaelic for New Scotland. Um, mm -hmm. And then when the people from uh, from Scotland come over to the New World. Uh, you know, 100, 150 years ago, they, they chose Cape Breton Island, the province of Nova Scotia, because it reminded them so much of home. And our landscape, very similar to Scotland, coastline, uh, a little bit cold, gray, uh, a little bit damp in the winters and, and even the spring and the fall. Uh, you know, you, you grow up in, in the ocean like I did the North Atlantic. Uh, you're used to that cold wind going through to your bones, the dampness and everything like that. <laughs> but uh, the majority of my family uh, had settled in, in Cape Breton Island when they came over originally from Scotland. And the large majority of my family still lives there uh, today. Um, so and uh, it's exciting. Uh, my father, you know, uh, when I told him I was going to take this job, uh, we already talked about a trip and him coming over. Uh, he's done with, with research with his family. They could trace our family all the way back to the early 1800s in Scotland to when they came over to, to Nova Scotia, uh, branches of our family. You know, we I, when I was growing up, I had a Cameron clan uh, toque and a scarf and a pair of mittens. Uh, I had a little set of toy bagpipes when I was uh, uh, in a little in small kind of toy bagpipes when I was a kid. Just three holes to blow and play, but, uh, you know, it was brought up with very much a, a strong, um, you know, feeling for Scotland and, and our heritage there. And conversely, my mother's side's all from England and my grandmother was from London. <laughs> Um, I mean, no, we don't need to go into that. That's less yeah, interesting. But, you know, I'm a Cameron. I'm not a, you know, my, my grandmother's side was Easton, but I'm a, I'm yeah. a Cameron through and through. And uh, my father has always made sure, you know, that we had very Scottish names. As I said, Duncan Alexander, Malcolm Angus. Uh, oh, my, wow. yeah. my, my son's name is Brett Malcolm Angus. Uh, my other son's name is Logan Alexander, so we we've got that <laughs> tradition of of names, you know, throughout uh, throughout our family, and we've got lots of cousins that are Duncans and Alexanders, and yeah, so it's it's an oh. exciting time for my family anyway uh, to come over. It sounds like those flights from Halifax are going to be busy then when you're over here if, uh, if we get COVID sorted. And the good news is you've got a new tartan now. You've got the the Glasgow clan. You can add your purple tartan to your Cameron one then. So well, I'm, I'm, all I'm extra in, signing on deals for you. <laughs> absolutely, I'll wear one. I'll, you know, if it's a scarf, I'll wear one over each shoulder, and uh, maybe I can have a split, a split hat or something. But uh, yeah. you know, my my father said, "How do you feel about wearing a kilt on the bench?" You know, maybe for the first game. And I said, "Hey, I've picked." it before and you know we've actually had a Scottish head coach yeah I couldn't get Pete to wear it I couldn't get last you might we might be the first time we've got a head coach wearing a kilt on the bench there you I, are I, I can honestly <laughs> say I, I, no, no joke I'm glad this is being recorded I, I actually I, you know maybe it's a little different for you guys because you know you grow up with that there you know back in Nova Scotia you you, you know my, my best friends is Stuart uh when he got married uh in Cape Breton they all wore Stuart kilts so yeah. I, I couldn't make it because my sister got married in the same day uh but i that was my one chance as an adult to wear a kilt so i, I wouldn't say no i wouldn't bet against right. the fact that i would probably do something like that well i'm sensing that there's going to be more chances for that anyway <laughs> malcolm thank you very much for uh, for chatting to us just now i know we're going to hear a lot more from you look forward to you being over here yeah so just on behalf of the fans everyone welcome to the clan I appreciate it. Look forward to meeting everybody when I get over there.